Hello, and welcome to episode four on our GK Icon Academy's USA panel conversations. And today, or in this episode, we're going to get into communication. But before we do so, I'd like to introduce our panel today. On our panel, we have Coach Sam Gribowitz. Sam is an assistant and goalkeeper coach for California University of Pennsylvania on the women's soccer team. Um, she's also a goalkeeper coach with a local club here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have Coach Matt Piscaglia, who is a goalkeeper coach at University of Pittsburgh Greensburg. And last year, Coach Matt won the 2019 Olympic Development Program PA West ODP Coach of the Year for goalkeeping, as voted on by his peers. Congrats, sir. And we also have Coach Mark Duffield, who is the head coach in the men's program at Penn State New Kensington. He's also the goalkeeper coach within the NPSL for our Pittsburgh Hotspurs, and he was also a director of goalkeeping for a local club. Welcome, everybody. Sam, let's start with you. Again, communication. Let's get right into it. What do you look for in a goalkeeper from a communication standpoint? The main things that I look for from my goalkeepers is consistency and confidence in the messages that they're getting out to their team. I want it to be, you know, straight and to the point. Uh, so there's no miscommunication. There's no confusion about what the goalkeeper is telling them to do. Uh, and that, and from there, it, you know, it, whatever message or however they phrase it, as long as it's clear and concise, that's the main thing that I want goalkeepers to be doing. Nice. Coach Mark, what do you look for in your goalkeepers in regards to communication? Um, I think it's one, I'm about to say one thing that you should, I've heard, I know you've heard many a time from me before, Eric, when we've worked together. It's the, it's the goalkeeping, creating that persona. Um, you know, growing up, and I'm, if you've listened to a number of these podcasts, you, this name comes up a lot. Peter Schmeichel was always my hero growing up, and he was very vocal. Um, so I always try and say to goalkeepers, especially from a young age, learn to communicate, you know, have that persona where you might be the quietest person off the field, but the second you cross that white line, you have to, you have to create some sort of personality. You know, be loud. But again, don't be loud for just the sake of being loud. It's got to be precise information and let your defenders and the rest of your team know how you know, they're confident you're back there because of the way in which you're vocalizing yourself. Well said. Well said. Coach Matt. Yeah, I think a place that I'll start with is just um, being loud, being consistent, and being confident with what in what you're saying. Uh, we're really going to just get specific uh, with our communication pieces, but if you can start out with being loud, consistent with being, that might be with loud, with what you're saying, what you're trying to tell your teammates, um, and then if you can be confident in what you're saying is – uh, correct and what you're trying to get across to your teammates. That's just going to help with those other two pieces of being consistent and being loud. Um, but I think that's a place to start is just figuring out what you need to say and how to get that message across. Yeah, let's start. You all mentioned one word that was very um, consistent and that word was loud. Let's, let's speak. I want to speak specifically to not only the volume of their commands, but the tone of their commands. Um, Coach Matt, let's, let's continue with you. What's your take on those two? So volume, I mean, you should be loud if it's 90 minutes you're playing, all 90 minutes. If you're playing anything less than that, if you're younger, um, for the entire entirety of, your, of the game, of the match. Um, but being loud is the number one thing. Uh, believe it or not, the players in front of us, they have other things to deal with. They're hearing other things as well. Um, and it's not even that we may be playing in front of giant crowds uh, but even if it's just with our parents on the sideline we still have to be loud because they're it's hard to hear it can be hard to hear for them while they're in the moment trying to react and focus on a bunch of other aspects and elements um, so we have to be loud so they can hear us and obviously uh, just one more thing I'll say with being loud is just based on where the ball is at on the field uh, and this goes into our tone so we're going to communicate differently when the ball is in the far 18 on the other end of the field as if the ball were in our own 18. The tone changes incredibly different because what we're trying to get across to our teammates, to our defenders, maybe uh, what we're trying to relay to them is totally opposite things. 
when the ball's in our box, for example, we have to be as loud as we can be. We have to be the loudest player on the field because that's more of an urgent situation. Um, when the ball is in the attacking half, the final third maybe even, um, we don't have to be as urgent with what we're saying, but obviously we can still be loud to start to direct our teammates um, on where they might need to go if we're, if we're starting to lose the ball um, or finding those gaps and those spaces that the other team's players might be in um, once we transition to losing the ball. So, Coach Sam. I agree with a lot of the points that Matt brought up. You want to have a loud enough volume so that everybody on the field can hear you. I think that's a given. As far as the tone goes, I also agree that the time of the game, as well as where on the field you are, also needs to be taken into account. Um, you don't want to be barking orders constantly at your defenders or your teammates, because then eventually they're going to start to tune you out. So you want to make sure that you're adjusting based on time and game, where on the field it is, what situation's happening, so as not to create a panic if you're barking orders at them and they start to get frantic because you sound frantic. So that's very important to keep in mind as well. Nice, nice, Coach Mark. Also, I think you've got to know your team as well. Um, you know, a common story I would tell, you know, for example, some players like to be shouted at, some players need the arm around the shoulder type. and that, that goes into my coaching as well. But I also had that as a goalkeeper. I always remember having a left back and a right back. The right back, you could shout and scream at him the whole game, and that motivated him. That got him going. He played 110%. On the other hand, I had a left back, one of the best left backs in the area. If you started shouting at him, might as well take him off. Like he was dumb. So if he made a mistake, he, like he knew he made a mistake. There's no need to shout at him. So he just needed like a little bit of reinsurance, a little bit of arm around the shoulder. Um, so I think a great goalkeeper also knows who their players are and who they can talk to and shout at. Also, being loud can have an effect on the opposition. If I come out for a corner and there's a goalie screaming as loud as they can, keepers, the attacker's is going to be like, whoa, okay, it's, all, it's all yours, buddy. They're going to drop back. Even from a defensive standpoint, if they're playing a through ball and the keeper shouts, the keeper's ball, that makes it easier for the defender. All they've got to do now is just shuttle the ball back to the keeper. If they don't say anything, that's when you see a lot of mistakes with the keeper and defenders will have a little clash. Striker comes in, thanks very much. So, definitely got to know your players. Actually, one of those, that was one of the things I was going to follow up with, Coach Mark, was in regards to like the different scenarios in a game. And the one I was going to use was regarding a cross or 50 50, to your point, too. When you're coming out for that, if you're, if you're coming out hard but speaking tentatively, you're probably going to have a nice little collision on your hands, yeah. truthfully. Um, you're coming out – and use, I want to use the coming out hard as a, a constant variable here, but your tone is one of – you're just screaming at the top of your lungs, coming out for that 50-50, and that, and, and that forward's going to think twice. And I think putting that doubt and putting that, like, you mentioned, you're like, ah, whoa, that little hesitant – that little hesitance from um, – from the, from the forward, it could pay huge dividends. And then, you know, we're the, I say this all the time, we're the only position on the field that can literally scream their position name and everyone knows what they're talking about. You know, you don't hear forward yell, forward! Like, it doesn't happen, right? But everyone's yelling keeper and keepers can yell keeper and come out hard. And, you know, people are going to think twice, especially on a cross in a box. Forwards are going up with their head. We're going up with our fist. Which, 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 side of the, which side of the coin would you want to be on? Would you want to be on the one that you're screaming, coming out hard, yelling keeper with your hands through the ball? Or are you one just going up quietly, looking ahead of the ball? I'd rather be the goalkeeper every time on that, on that scenario. Um, I feel it's an advantage that keepers have that, um, especially in the youth levels, you know, it's not utilized enough in regards to the, the, the loud, strong, toned keeper call. And that, um, that's, again, those two scenarios, Mark, that you just mentioned, whether it's the, the cross, or that 50-50, I think, are, you know, two important scenarios that keepers come across all the time. Coach Mark. I, was just saying, I think from a, from a training environment to coaches, I think especially at a young age, I would call it the foundation phase. I think it's very, very important to get those goalkeepers at a young age not being scared to talk. Yeah. You know, again, I'll jump back to you, Eric. I know we've done a number of sessions together where, we've, you know, some of the keepers are very hesitant to talk and all that sort of stuff. It's like, hey, guys, do it in practice. 
become second nature in a game. So if, for the coaches that are listening, really try and encourage vocal goalkeepers from a young age. Yeah, and, and look, let's continue with that. What commands, if I'm a young goalkeeper, I'm, I'm U10, U12, and I'm a new goal, I'm a, I'm a goalkeeper, I'm a new coach, I'm trying to get my keeper to talk, what commands do you want them to emphasize? Or like, what are the first few commands you want them to really take on and master? Coach Sam, can I start with you? Yeah, I think some of the most important ones, especially for the younger kids, are keeper. So then that way they build that confidence and build that early on so that, you know, everybody around them knows that that's their ball and they have no trouble going up for anything and calling their, you know, calling keeper when they go up. In relation to that, I think away, the, the away call is also important because those two sort of go hand in hand and those are just very simple ones so that the other, the teammates around them know what the keeper's doing. From there, I think some other important ones might be, you know, push up. Because uh, at that age, they're starting to learn a little bit of that of, okay, now everybody needs to get up. Keeper has the ball. Let's all push up. Things like that. Um, keeping it as simple as possible, but still making sure that they're direct and specific so that they continue throughout their development. Well said. Coach Matt. Yeah, I think Sam covered uh, pretty much all of them that I would think of off the top of my head. Um, those are kind of your foundation, the general ones that you can take uh, really from team to team. If you watch. Uh, team A on one field, uh, you're going to hear those as those commands coming, hopefully from the goalkeeper if they're communicating. If you would go maybe to another field, the field right next to it, to team B over there, and you would most likely hear those same general commands coming from uh, the, that goalkeeper as well. Um, and I think as well, where to start, where we can start off with with keeper is just importantly using keeper. Because um, if you try to go with keep, that's going to get uh, mixed up with other other things, people saying other words maybe, um, and especially mine. I, I hear goalkeepers try to use mine, um, and it's just that's the easiest one to get mixed up with with any anything else that somebody could be saying. Um, so that's why it is really good to s just start with keeper and run with it because um, that's going to be your go-to. Uh, for that command but otherwise I think our list for that you know the, the short list here for the general command to start with is is pretty well covered what's that coach Mark oh yeah I jump on the back thing what they both said was fantastic also make sure we educate the goalkeepers in when and how to use those words as well you, know, you see some keepers they're collecting the ball in their chest or they're diving and they suddenly shout keepers um, it's educating them like if you're going to shout keepers make sure you shout it nice and early so it helps the defenders. And obviously, when you shout away, make sure it's loud and precise. Just like educating on when and where to use it as well from a young age. Yeah. And the one command I was going to say, and you all touched on it, was the away command. Because um, in, in reality, the older you get, or that's not, not true, and at any age, really, I feel that keepers, there's more of an opportunity for an away call than there is for a keeper call. And at the younger ages, it's, you know, kids are tentative. You know, so they're probably not going to be coming out screaming keeper. Plus the long cross into the box at that age doesn't happen that often either. So it's more of a 50-50 when a keeper comes out yelling keeper. Um, but away, I think, happens all the time based on what I see in the, the, the teams that I see at that age. And getting them to just have that effective communication with their back line in particular early. And the, again, we're talking about the early stage of development with communication, I think is key. And some of the other as they start to grow. So you have keeper, you have a way. Um, when you start getting involved with the game and when that starts, man on, turn. You know, getting involved in that, being in the part of the option as a player can play back to you. Um, you know, we talk about non-visual cues a lot as well. We'll get into that too. Um, but I think those four are the early, I believe to be the early, you know, let's master those at a young age. And then let's build on that which I'd like to start now. Like what would what'd be the next step? Coach Mark, let's go there. What, what is the next step? You have that goalkeeper who has those four commands down. What, what's the, what are you looking for now out of you? They're loud, the tone's good, but those are the only four tones, the only, only four commands that they're really focusing on. What are you looking for that next development phase for a goalkeeper regarding communication? I mean, I think you could use you know, stuff like um, left man on left shoulder, right shoulder, 
touch tight. Again, it's, but again, I also think it comes from a club culture because everyone has to understand what these, these calls mean. You know, for example, you play for Team A, everyone knows if I say touch tight, it means X, Y, you know, it means X. Um, so it's got to be making sure that all the literature is the same along, along the club as well. Um, yeah, drop, you know, drop right. It's all it's just little things like something simple that it's not like a full on sentence. Like, Eric, turn to your left, drop it there. And, it's, and you're like, what, what, what? It's got to be short, sharp, and precise. Eric, drop left shoulder, you know, straight away where I want it. Yep, yep. Coach Sam. I agree with all of those points. Um, that's where you can start getting more specific and start building that trust and constant flow of communication between your back line and the rest of your team. Uh, so all of those commands along with, you know, maybe check your shoulder or watch the weak side just so, you know, your players are staying aware of everything that's around them in addition to all those calls. Uh, the main thing, once you get past that basic, those calls, like I said, that's when you can start building that trust with your communication, becoming specific with, you know, your team so that they know exactly, you know, what they're hearing, what they need to do, and just building that repetition in consistency. Well said. Coach Matt. Yeah, so as we're starting to get more advanced with our communication, obviously we're going to start to cover more of the, the events of the game, you know, and that turns into us just communicating more um, and more frequently uh, throughout the duration of the game. And that's when that tone, uh, the tone of our voice comes into play. Because uh, if, if we're saying everything loud and all the same way, it's just going to get uh, pushed aside uh, or it's not going to make any difference on what we're trying to say, where the ball might be uh, to the rest of our team. That's when that urgency starts to come in as well and really know like when I need to be m the most urgent based on where the ball is at, what the situation might be, and when I can kind of tone it back a bit um, and not be more casual, but just not as urgent with our communication if the ball is in the, in the other half or the final third even. But I think whenever it starts to get more complex uh, with our communication, it needs to be like a two-way street. And so what I mean by that is just that both what we're – we need to understand what we're saying and so do the players on, on the field and even our coach. Um, so like what Mark said with the club culture, just kind of scale down even to with your team. Because first we need to make sure that what I'm saying, what I'm trying to tell my teammates on the field, they understand what that means. Um, so that's just building relationships with your players, making sure that, you know, in practice, off the field, whenever it may be, but you're just letting them know, like, hey, when I'm saying this, you know, this is what I mean um, and this is what I need from you. Um, because we want to keep it short. We want to keep it simple from what we're saying. Yeah. Um, so if we can kind of relay our messages off the field as prep uh, or in training even, um, so when we're on the field and playing, you know, I can just start spitting those out and everyone's on board with, with what, I'm, what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think, and, and I'm going to just kind of elaborate a little bit on what all three of you said. Um, in understanding or having a club culture in regards to when this is said, everyone knows what I mean. And some of the better clubs that I've seen actually produce and hand out a document with basic commands on them. And here's the definition and don't stray from that. And once I think the culture or the, or the club emphasizes those communication points, there's no com there's no commun there's no um, miscommunication and there's no confusion and it puts everyone on the same page. And then it's up to the goalkeeper and the goalkeeper coach and the team because you know, communication is a two-way street. You know, people not only have to speak, but people need to listen. And we're going to get into that in a moment, too, in regards to what happens when a, when a player is not listening because it impacts the whole team. And we'll get into that in a moment. Um, the other piece I, I wanted to emphasize, too, was uh, speak in short phrases. You know, I, I use the phrase caveman talk. You know, three words or less. But, you, but be specific. You know, Matt, Mark 12, number 12. Or Coach Mark, back door, goal side. You know, so very specific. But again, everyone needs to understand what that means because once you start turning into, let's call it the Charlie Brown teacher, where everyone that is constantly talking and talking, people are going to tune you out. 
You know, they're not even going to listen to you. Even the most basic commands, they're not going to listen to you because they're, they're to you, I think Coach Pat said it earlier, there's so much going on around them in their immediate area. You're just background noise. You, you know, so you need to make sure that you say it at the right time with the right tone, with the right emphasis, but you're very specific and there's no miscommunication. I think that those couple of key points are very important, especially for a younger goalie. You know, they need to have that confidence. And not only that, they need to have the support of their coach. And the coach needs to say something in front of the team, guys. You hear the commands. Here's what their goalkeepers can say. Here's what you need to do. Because they have the advantage of seeing the, the whole field. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, what I, let's, let's get into that right now. What happens when a, when a player is not listening to a command from a goalkeeper? Um, what do you do? Because they can have dramatic impacts on the result of a game if, if someone's not listening. That could lead to a goal. That could lead to a, a through ball when all of a sudden the player is onside, when everyone was pu pushing up trying to you know, keep hold that line, that high line. Um, Coach Mark, what would, what's, what's your suggestion for a goalkeeper, a U12 goalkeeper as an example, no, there's a certain player or two not listening. What's your guidance for that for that goalkeeper? Consistency. Don't give up. You know, um, you'll see, I mean, I, I spoke to a couple of goalies myself and they'll be like, oh, you know, coach, I say X, Y, and Z and player S doesn't listen to me. And then I said, well, I said, I said to them, like, what do you do next? And they say, oh, well, I just, I just stop. I said, what's the point of me talking now if no one's going to listen to me? And I think that's the biggest mistake you can make. I feel like you as a goalkeeper have to show that confidence and belief in yourself that you know what you're saying is correct. So they don't listen to you the first couple of times. You can't just stop. You just got to keep being persistent and keep going. And from my experience, persistency will pay off in the end and they will learn to, uh, they will learn to listen to you. Coach Sam. Call the player by name. You know, if it's somebody who's, not listening to you as the goalkeeper play after play, make sure that you're including their name in that command. And that goes back to being specific and direct is so that there's no question of if it's them that you're talking to or if it's somebody else. I think also at the U12 age or the younger ages, it also needs to come from the coach as well along the lines of, you know, clear communication and what needs to be said when from club or coach down so that if those are consistent problems that they're being corrected right away. But I think the being direct, calling their name and being persistent, like Mark said, over and over again, will finally, hopefully, uh, get it to click in. Coach Matt, we're communicating in that exact way that Coach Sam is saying but the player still doesn't listen. What does the, what does the goalkeeper do next? Yeah, and this, this is where it starts to get very, or it's very, very dependent on the situation and who that player might be. Um, maybe for a U12 goalkeeper, uh, maybe that might be going to your coach and saying, hey, coach, like, I'm trying to get so-and-so to do what I'm asking them or communicating to do to them in the game. Um, can you help relay that message for me? But I think as we get older and we go outside the realm of just, you know, U12, starting to think older now, you know, we just need to, that's where the relationship with our players comes into play. If you feel like uh, you know that the player that is, that you're struggling with, um, they can handle you with maybe giving them a shout during the game, you know, starting to pick, it, pick on them a little bit, uh, then you can do that right in the moment of the game. Uh, obviously depending on the situation um, but it may be a player just like we touched upon earlier that might not be able to handle that um, so then that's when you kind of maybe it's as you're going off for halftime or at the end of the game um, just giving them that nudge on a friendly basis because we don't want to make enemies these are our teammates who want to be all on the same side um, but that's when you just kind of let them know give them that message be like hey maybe you might not know what I'm trying to tell you it let me know if you can't hear me, but it's just that one-on-one -on -one relationship to kind of figure that out, find what the problem might be, um, and then so we can fix it. And it might be for the next game, might be for the second half, but the quicker we can take care of that, uh, the better off we'll be as a whole for our entire team. Yeah. Coach Mark? 
you're in that situation. A player comes to you and, and has that issue. What do you what do you give them for advice? What do you do? What do you what do you tell your goalkeepers and your players? Well, I I think if a goalie comes up to me and says, "Hey, coach, you know, I've got this issue," I think the thing is this is where it's a big moment for us as a coach. I feel like that's I don't I'm not a big fan of calling kids out. I don't think I'll turn around and say, "Hey, Eric." You know, I think I'll get us in a group set and be like, look, hey, guys, I just want to let you know my expectations. Um, I see Sam as my goalkeeper. I see her as one of my coaches on the field. She can see everything. If she's saying X, Y, I would listen to her. You know, they have the best view. Right now, you can't see anything around you as a player. Maybe you're more focused on this. The goalkeeper role is to scan the whole field. They're not just shouting something out at you just to hear their voice. They're trying to do what's best for the team. So make sure you listen to what the goalkeeper says. Well done. Coach Sam, what would you add to that? I use that exact same technique in sessions. If we're doing something around the goal mouth and I recognize it, or if the goalkeeper has mentioned to me prior to that session that this is the problem, so-and-so is not listening to me, then I'll use the chance in the middle of, a, of an activity or a scrimmage to point that out to the team, just like he was mentioning, whether it's you know, in the group huddle off to the side or if it's on the field, that way, you know, it's happening in real time and they're seeing exactly what I want and what the goalkeeper wants as it's happening. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think your relationship, I think Coach Matt mentioned it earlier, the, the relationship with your back line is, is incredibly important. And you, we're not saying you have to be best buds, right? But at the same time, there needs to be a mutual respect um, that here's where I, I I see a lot of kids they, they don't like to be told what to do or even players for that matter but when the when the understanding comes in that hey I'm trying to give you the answers to the test all of a sudden you got a new perspective oh wait yeah that, I like answers to the test you know that's that's a that's not a bad way of uh, of, of looking at it because now I know that what he that goalkeeper is telling me as a field player is for the benefit of everybody. And, and it's not me telling or a goalkeeper telling someone what to do. It's here's the tactical awareness on what we're trying to accomplish as a unit. And this one link isn't synced up with everyone else. But once that's communicated, we're going we're gonna to be okay. And, and I think that's a very important piece of an understanding from a team perspective. Um, so well said. I think you guys really hit that on the head. Well done. Well done. Um, Positive commands. And when I say positive commands, I mean um, not a cheerleader, but at the same time, I think sometimes that's needed. And what I mean by what I'm going to ask you guys is when is it needed and what's the purpose behind it? Coach Sam, I'm going to start with you. The first example that pops into my head is say, for instance, I'm coming out for the ball as the goalkeeper, I fumble it ricochets off me or something and one of my defenders runs behind me and is able to clear the ball successfully when I either made a mistake or just something happened and I didn't get the ball I think a positive command would be making sure that you praise that defender for you know covering you because that's exactly what we want is when we're coming out we're there to cover them but also we want to make sure that they're covering us so just making sure that we capitalize on the moments to praise our defenders when they do something right or when we give them a command in a game, it goes right, does exactly as planned, and then we reaffirm that so that they know that that's what I was looking for. Good job. Thank you. Right, right. And Coach, Coach Matt, what's the benefit to that? Why, why would a goalkeeper need to do that? Well, I think that all ties into um, our, the effect, effectiveness of, the play, of our players, what they're – they're listening to us and how they're reacting to when we are kind of barking at them to, to get something done. Um, if we can show our gratitude, uh, that, that just gets them on board. Um, and maybe even to get very specific, uh, maybe we're, we're down, uh, we're losing the guys or the girls. Uh, our team is just starting to drag a little bit. You know, something big happens. Maybe my defender in front of me jumps in front of a shot to block it. You know, I'm clapping. I'm letting them really know how much I appreciated that. Just to maybe even spark some energy out of our team. Um, if it's starting to get late, maybe we're just going to uh, get some energy to get going and maybe tie the game up or take the lead. Um, but I think the, the positive affirmation, the positive communication, 
can be just as important for our teammates uh, as the, not negative, but more the precise and the, um, the wants that we have when we're communicating to our, our team. Um, but we just really need to show, you know, that our gratitude, how much we appreciate something very small that it can be from our teammates. Um, just so they're on board, you know, maybe it's an energy thing, uh, but that, that stuff we can control just with our own voice and that can, you know, determine an outcome of, of a game. For sure. Can I add something to that real quick? Absolutely, please. Um, you brought up a great point of that, you know, how we communicate and how we're talking influences the rest of the team. And I just wanted to add that body language as well, you know, plays into that. If I'm save the ball and I'm quickly trying to get to the top of the box and I'm hustling, that's going to tell the rest of my team, oh crap, I should probably get moving too. Whereas if I am slowly getting up, I'm walking, they're probably going to do the same. So I think in our voice, and in our body language, we can dictate the pace of our players and the situation that's in front of us. Yeah. Coach Mark. I mean, to be fair, I think these two have done a great job there of covering it, but I do think people underestimate how a small piece of positive, you know, even as a little tap on the back, how it can totally change someone's game. Mm-hmm. You know, it can also change, change a moment as well. I mean, that he said, you know, for example, if a defender, you know, you could be down or whatever, a defender makes that last minute slide. And if you let them know how passionate you are about it, that gets the whole team going. And maybe you go on and win 3-2. Or if you're 2-1 up and it's, you know, people are making these last ditch tackles, again, you're that positive influence then. They're like, oh, okay, we can do this. And everyone just bands together. You know, I, I definitely think positive reinforcement, even if it's a small little tap on the back or something like that, can totally change a person or a whole team's game. Yeah, I, I love it. I agree with you guys. I think, and we're, again, we're not going to turn the cheerleaders – you know, and, and compliment every single thing. Um, however, at the right moment, at the right time, when it's said to somebody, and this is a life lesson, truthfully, like it just can help somebody get through that moment or spark, like Mark just said, it, it, a team lifting or something to that nature. So I'm, I, I love what you guys, what you guys mentioned there. Um, sorry. Last topic. Oh, Mark, go right ahead. Sorry. And I was going to say, like, I think what you just said that sometimes it becomes patronizing. If I like literally pat Matt on the show, I pat Matt. Good pass, you know. Good pass. Hey, yeah. high five! And it becomes like it's like you're patronizing me. It's like, come on, behave. Know when and where to use it. And be effective with it. Yeah. All right, five minutes left, guys. So one more topic, and then we're gonna have our final final words. Uh, but let's let's do with. Um, I think Sam touched on it earlier, but I want to get a little bit more detailed with it. The the nonverbal communications. Um, Sam, I'm gonna go back to you with this. What what's an example of a nonverbal communication? What else would you emphasize besides just your your body language? I think I would also include the nonverbal when I'm giving directions. If the place facing me and whether it's the the first example is if somebody, if I want them to play the ball back to me, I'm going to use my hand to point which foot I want it on or where. Um, I also may be moving. And so I want to make sure that they're going to play it ahead of me um, and they know and they hear and they can see exactly what I want because, you know, that just helps drive the point, make sure there's no confusion, and they can see exactly what I want. Yeah. Coach Matt? Yeah, I'll just say that the nonverbal uh, communication is just used to aid the, our verbal communication. Uh, it can happen simultaneously uh, with each other. But, um, you know, it's simple, something as simple as, you know, showing that hand to which foot you want the ball played back to you just aids it. It's a safety net. Um, to just help with that verbal communication. Because maybe they don't hear us, but they look up, they can see that I have my hand down, I'm in a position to receive the ball. That's that's the cue to play that ball back to the keeper. Um, they can't see what's behind them. So obviously if they are facing us, that, that'll just let them know that we're that best option for them. Mm-hmm. Coach Mark. Well, like I said, I think these two have done a great job of summing that up as well. I mean, like I said, you might say left shoulder, look around, if you're just stood there like a pencil, they don't know where you want it, but that non-verbal communication of me just sticking my hand out lets them know I want it on my, my back foot, I want a leading pass so I can step into it and then switch the point of attack. So a little hand gesture does so much. I, I, and I feel like as coaches, they need to make sure they reinforce and training sessions. A simple little activity that involves the keeper using some non-verbal, and they can go and transfer that into a game. I, I love it. And I think you know, also, too, sometimes field players – 
you know, they're not always facing, we're always facing, the, for the most part, we're always facing the same direction, right? And I think sometimes field players, they're facing side, they're facing you as your, your goalkeeper, they're facing the attacking goal. So you saying left, right, sometimes doesn't resonate with them. It doesn't, they don't understand which way that you're actually speaking to. So, you know, I'm always, you know, I'm constantly telling my goalkeepers, use hands. You know, when pointing to someone or when talking, use your hands. That is a, when players are down, they quickly look up to check your surroundings and they just see a hand or a big white palm, that they're going to go for that or whatever that might be. And I think that extra little guidance that goes a long way, more than people think in, in my mind. And same thing with set pieces as well. Yeah. That's where oh, there's a lot of confusion. Everybody's in one area. And so using, you know, your hand to just point the direction you want the wall to move sometimes gets across a lot easier than trying to scream over everybody that's around you. Yeah. Yeah. Last, uh, last minute, everyone gets around 15 seconds to summarize. If you're okay with that coach, Matt, I'm going to start with you if you're okay. Yeah. Um, so as we just progress farther in our game, uh, we get to a point where everybody is a good shot stopper. Everyone is, can make a save. Um, so if you're looking to play at that next level, maybe that's high school for you, college for you, whatever that may be, you know, something like communication is just an aspect of the game that if you can be good at it and you can be master it, that's going to set you apart, make you the, the one, the first keeper rather than the second one. Mm -hmm. Well done. Coach Sam. Be direct, be concise, use communication with your teammates to find your voice or your persona. And the one that works with your team, keep doing it. Keep hammering it into them. It doesn't have to be the exact same from team to team. If it works for you, short, concise, to the point, we'll get the job done. Nice. Coach Mark? I'll end with some of the best goalkeepers aren't necessarily the goalies that make the saves with their hands, but the ones that do it with their voice. And what I mean by that is they set their team up so well that the only shots they receive are the long-range ones and stuff like that because they've done such a good job with their vocal skills. Communication is massive for goalkeepers create that on-field persona yeah i love that. I, I i'm not even going to add to it because i think all three of you just nailed it and and on the from the non-verbals to the short and sweet efficiency um you guys were, were great and i i, I really believe